Welcome to the next session, the future of the Liberal Party, or as I've chosen to call it, uh, everyone's favourite libertarian pastime, throw stones at the Liberal Party. So I really want to encourage people to challenge ideas, uh, challenge what is said uh, by the speakers. I'll be keeping up with the comments as we go along. Uh, what we've organised, uh, purely by coincidence here, is a little bit of a past, present and future of the Liberal Party. So we're going to start off by hearing from Nick Minchin. Now, uh, Nick ha will establish, uh, well, he has a lot, it'll be very easy for him to establish the history of the Liberal Party. He's been a campaign director, a president, a uh, senator. Uh, he was the finance minister uh, for the Howard government, but only in the bad bit between 2001 and 2007 when they started to try and buy votes. Uh, I'm. <laughs> I'm hoping he'll have an explanation for the blowout of middle class welfare somewhere in his talk. Everyone, welcome Nick Minchin. Well, thanks a lot, Rod. Um, I guess I'll take it in my stride that I represent the past. Um, but um, I, uh, I must say it, it's um, gratifying that uh, the future of the Liberal Party is so well assured with people like James and Harry uh, on, the, on the panel. Um, I was a, indeed a full-time servant of the Liberal Party for some 32 years in a range of uh, full-time responsibilities from uh, State Director, Deputy Federal Director, humble Senator and uh, Leader of the Government in the Senate. Um, so I do know its strengths and weaknesses um, and uh, I'm nevertheless a great believer in the importance of the mission of the Liberal Party of Australia and I will defend it against all the attacks from the, the rods of the world. Um, the, um, the, the Liberal Party does have an immense responsibility as the predominant centre-right party in this country, and I think that role will continue. And it has that responsibility to devise and implement policies based on its values and its principles. Um, Tim Andrews, when he asked me to be on this panel, asked me to focus on how to achieve policy, positive policy change through the Liberal Party and how I was successful in doing so, which was kind of him to suggest that. But, and I don't want to indulge in undue false modesty, but frankly, I was hugely unsuccessful in most of my policy ambitions during all that time in the Liberal Party. Uh, my children, now adults, like to call me the patron saint of lost causes, because um, <laughs> they put up with me throwing things at the TV and at the wall um, through most of my political career. And, and it's true, I did spend um, many years banging my head against a brick wall, uh, for example, trying to get the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party, uh, to introduce vol voluntary voting. I would have thought a core principle of the Liberal Party, all to no avail. Um, Australia's system of compulsory voting, which we've only had since the 1920s, we did have 20 years where Australians were free to choose whether or not to vote, um, is utterly illiberal. But all I managed to achieve in all my campaigning and fighting and arguing was a resolution at, at a federal council uh, many years ago in favour of returning the right of voters to choose whether or not to vote. And of course the Liberal Party takes no notice of resolutions of its federal council. Um, <laughs> and indeed in all those years of advocacy only one uh, state or federal Liberal government even attempted uh, to reintroduce uh, voluntary voting and that was um, to its credit, a former state uh, government in South Australia, where I was, uh, as you know, the senator and state director. Um, and that uh, fell foul of an upper house that, of course, it didn't control. And um, although I do regard myself as, as a conservative, not a libertarian, although the first party I joined was John Singleton's Workers' Party in the early 70s, which was a forerunner of the uh, libertarian, and it was a libertarian party, um, certainly the driving, a driving principle of mine has been the liberty of the individual and it's why I joined uh, the Liberal Party. And it has been odd that not as many of my parliamentary colleagues during my time quite shared that passion, which was a surprise to me. Um, but I've, I've opposed things like compulsory bike helmet laws, um, the constant oppression of citizens who choose to smoke, even though I don't smoke, they should be free to, but we oppress them and treat them as you know, lepers. Um, the, the extraordinary and outrageous compulsion to put 
that poison called ethanol in our motor vehicles. And where Peter Phelps was here before, I, you know, Peter Phelps has done a brilliant job standing up to the ethanol lobby, again to no avail. We are forced to put this rubbish in our cars. All of those things, unfortunately, um, I achieved nothing. Uh, I've, and I've opposed virtually every policy uh, designed to appease the climate alarmists um, uh, in our midst, again, with very little luck. Uh, although I would like to think that my resignation from Malcolm Turnbull's shadow cabinet played some part in preventing uh, Kevin Rudd's emissions trading scheme ever becoming law. Um, I've argued unsuccessfully within the Liberal Party for the sale of Australia Post and the ABC. Um, and I failed um, spectacularly in my responsibility to privatise the Snowy Hydro uh, when Alan Jones and then Senator Bill Heffernan uh, ganged up on me and ran a massive campaign against that sale and now, remarkably, the government has nationalised that business entirely. Um, so, see how the wheel turns. So I guess I'm a uh, living testament to the bitter reality that policy change to reduce the size and scope and scale of government in this country is hard work. Well, maybe I was just very poor at it. Um, you be the judges. But um, I'd have to say in a democracy like ours, change and the sort of change that we in this room would want is very hard. Um, vested interests are incredibly powerful. Um, we do have uh, a Senate which was originally designed to be a state's house but is now, uh, and it is a very powerful second chamber. If you look around the world, ours is one of the most powerful uh, upper houses and it's unfortunately encumbered with a, uh, an electoral system that produces a motley crew of cross benches um, who oppose the government of the day on so many occasions. And um, uh, interesting to hear the panel from before, but the fact is, and depressingly for many of us, Australians seem to like big government. Um, and I'll come to that. But positive change is, of course, possible. And I think the Howard government, of which I was privileged to be a member, um, did achieve an enormous amount, despite not having a Senate majority for 10 of its 12 years. And even I was the leader of the government in the Senate when we did have a Senate majority for those two years, but it was a one-seat majority um, with Barnaby Joyce included in that majority. <laughs> and he held a gun to my head almost every day the Senate met. Um, but it, it was my privilege to be centrally involved in some of the um, biggest policy achievements of that government, the full privatisation of Telstra. Um, the sale of, of Sydney Airport, uh, the creation of the Future Fund, uh, the complete elimination of uh, Commonwealth debt and, and to his credit, very substantial tax reform and there's really been none since. Um, one of the most significant reforms of that government was of course gun law reform, uh, which um, perhaps Senator David Leonhelm doesn't like, but was a remarkable reform in the national interest uh, for this country. Um, one of my biggest personal fights was when I had responsibility when we came into government for reforming Paul Keating's utterly hopeless and very interventionist and anti-private uh, sector Native Title Act, where we did manage to um, achieve considerable success. Um, but democratic politics is the art of the possible. You can only achieve the degree of change that is possible in the circumstances, and I do find and I found during my parliamentary career that policy purists are inclined not to acknowledge the degree of difficulty involved in effecting change in a democracy like ours and, and too readily dismiss the efforts of those who are fighting in the trenches for every inch of ground that we can gain. And I do tell incoming MPs and newbies, this is an incremental business. Grab every victory you can and every inch of ground that you can as you make progress because it is very tough. Um, a sophisticated understanding of exactly what you want to achieve and why is fundamental to achieving change in the party. You've got to have a full comprehension of the minefield you'll have to navigate if you want to achieve change, and it is a minefield. You have to have very strong leaders guiding you through that minefield, um, and they have to have courage and resolution to take you there, and you have to have troops who won't turn at the first sign of grape shot uh, when the going get tough, gets tough, as it always does. 
And, and a sine qua non of achieving change is taking the public with you. And something, again, policy purists sometimes um, forget. Um, I do want to just say um, that the politics and change is about the art of persuasion. And that's a lesson that I think is too often forgotten. And, um, and it's something that we really do battle with uh, in this country. And, it, and it's still, having just lived in the US for three years as the Australian Consul General, uh, where my favourite state was New Hampshire, where its state slogan is live free or die. To come back to Australia is a rather depressing experience. Um, <laughs> you know, it's wonderful in New York where nobody pays any attention to traffic lights. You just cross when it's safe to do so. You know, and that's my attitude in Melbourne where I now live. But everybody stands there waiting for the light to turn green and then just walk out and they never look. A car could be coming straight through and wipe them out. Um, you know, that comes down to individual responsibility. But we... Um, one of the things that I, I do want to say is that, and really frightened me, is that uh, in the election studies analysis that's done after every election, in the 2016 election this was done, the proportion of Australian voters describing themselves as left, uh, you, could, you know, as left, centre or right, um, has gone up from 19.5% in the 96 election that we won and is now 31.4%. Um, which is very scary. The proportion describing themselves as right wing or on the right of politics has been as just steady on 27%. So we are now uh, in the minority compared to the centre and the left. Um, that to me is pretty scary. It shows that we've got a hell of a lot of work to do and it does come back to this issue that I said, the art of persuasion. We have to take Australians with us because they are remarkably inclined to want the government there to assist them. When you ask people what, um, you know, whether we want, uh, what you want the government to do in the budget, overwhelmingly I'll say, spend more on health, spend more on education, spend more on welfare. I was even horrified, in going back to the panel earlier today, 80% um, of the populace want us to at least maintain or increase spending on renewable energy. Only 12% want that cut. So we are, whatever you say about you know, liberals and liberal politicians like James, we are, it is a fight. Um, so it is fantastic to see a conference like this. Great to see so many young people here, but we've got the fight ahead of us. Thanks. Now, it was uh, remiss of me to uh, not mention why I am chairing this panel. Uh, I'm Roderick Schneider and I've been a member of the Liberal Party for 17 years, uh, contributed as a branch chair all the way up to president of the Young LNP in Queensland and I was vice president of the Federal Young Liberals which uh, meant that I got to sit on the federal executive. When I was first thinking about uh, running, when I decided I wanted to run for that spot, I uh, talked to my friends in a state to try and rally the numbers and uh, they were very, I tried to use Queensland's then, or the other state's hatred of Victoria to, uh, to rally my votes. And uh, they, I called my friends in other states and they said, you know, we, we do hate the Victorians, but uh, the other guy running, this James Patterson guy, he's actually really good. So, uh, you know, Rod, Rod probably don't, don't run because James, James is good. As it turns out, James got, then got a uh, promotion at the IPA and I think to everyone, in his work at the IPA uh, and now as a senator has proven to everyone that my friends were right and James is very good. And uh, it was very fortunate for me that he pulled out and that got me onto the federal executive of the Liberal Party. Uh, so to talk about the current state of play and affairs, please welcome James Patterson. Rod, thank you. There's been some serious, serious defamation of Victorians uh, in this conference so far. Uh, none more egregious than the previous panel uh, on the history of liberalism in Australia, uh, where Peter Phelps, uh, amid venerating uh, Bruce Smith as the great hero of liberalism uh, in Australia and bagging Victoria, neglected to mention that Bruce Smith is, of course, a Victorian. Uh, a brand is, in commercial terms, known as a promise kept. When you go to the supermarket and you buy dishwashing powder, you do so on the promise that if you put that dishwashing powder in your dishwasher at home with your dirty dishes and you turn it on, 
and you open it up afterwards, your dishes will be clean. If you have the experience of buying a particular brand of dishwashing powder that results in you opening your dishwasher after washing your dishes and your dishes not being clean, what happens to that brand? Well, you're not going to go back and buy that brand. You'll go and choose a different brand. The brand of politics of a political party is, of course, different to a commercial brand in one very important respect. Uh, as Nick pointed out, we have compulsory voting. Not only do we have compulsory voting, we have compulsory preferential voting. So even if you have a bad experience with a political brand, you basically have to buy it once every three years. But nonetheless, keeping a promise, keeping a promise as a political brand, I think is still a very important thing. And when I say keeping a promise, I don't mean uh, keeping a promise on a small scale in a technical sense. Of course, if you promise you're going to spend $2 million renovating the local sports field, it's important that you keep that promise. But I'm talking about a much more fundamental promise. Political parties must live up to what they profess that they are. Those of us who have joined the Liberal Party often do so because we read the We Believe statement of the Liberal Party. Uh, there's one in every division. They're broadly the same. In Victoria, I'll list a couple. Uh, we believe in the fundamental freedom of individuals and groups within society to think, worship, speak, choose and associate. We believe in upholding the constitution, parliamentary democracy, the democratic process and accountable government. We believe in equality before the law. Uh, we believe in free enterprise that will maximise economic growth and national prosperity. These are, this is the core promise of the Liberal Party and in answering the question what's the future of the Liberal Party, uh, my view is, and my role particularly as a senator is, to drag the Liberal Party back to that core promise and to remind ourselves and all those who support us, or at least once upon a time did support us, that we still stand up for those ideals. One of the things I've discovered in my short two and a bit years in the Senate is that it is much harder to do good, to get up a good policy initiative, than it is to stop a bad one. And I want to share with you some experience I've had in my uh, first two years that illustrate those points and come to Nick's point about how difficult it is to achieve change in a positive sense, but on the flip side at least, how it can be easy sometimes to stop bad things from happening. So I want to talk about um, two issues in particular. One is my experience advocating reform of Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, uh, how important that is to the core liberal philosophy of freedom of speech, but how difficult a task that was. But I could have equally chosen a topic that we heard about earlier in this room in the Rule of Law panel, which is freedom of religion, equally a very important topic uh, to liberal philosophy, uh, philosophy and our values, but surprisingly also equally a difficult issue to uh, prosecute as a liberal senator. And then in the negative sense, I'm going to talk about um, an experience I had uh, on an issue that might not be at the front of your mind, but I think is a very good illustration of this issue, which is the extradition treaty that was proposed between Australia and China. But equally, in that instance, I could have talked about another topic in the rule of law panel uh, this morning, uh, of constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. Uh, for a party that believes in upholding a constitution as it is, for a party that believes in equality before the law, uh, it shouldn't have required as much of a fight as it did in the end uh, to see off uh, very dangerous proposals in that space. So I'll come back to 18C. When I was first chosen for the Senate by Liberal members in Victoria, uh, at that time, the Liberal Party po policy was to make no changes to 18C. Uh, liberals in Victoria are like Liberals anywhere, they love free speech, and I campaigned on addressing that issue. Uh, the first interview that I did uh, the morning after I was pre-selected was with John Fain, uh, on 774 in Melbourne. Some of you would have heard of John. Uh, and he asked me what my priorities would be as a Senator of Victoria. And I had a whole list of things that I was planning to talk to him about and, and list off. But the first one that I started to talk about with him was freedom of speech in ADNC. Um, unsurprisingly, John took issue with uh, my interest in free speech in ADNC and we didn't even get on to any of the other policy ideas that I was going to propose. John Fain told me there is no point uh, advocating change to 18C, there is no point advocating res restoration of free speech in Australia because you are out of step with your government and you are out of step with your Prime Minister. And indeed, uh, surprisingly, you will, you'll um, be amused to learn I did not follow John Fain's advice, uh, as kind as it was for him to offer it. Um, but in a sense, he was right. It was more difficult than it should have been for a new Liberal senator to argue for free speech and changing 18C. And it was a remarkable thing that at that time that we didn't uh, have a policy of addressing 18C. And indeed, when I was elected and I started to be vocal on this issue, I had colleagues more senior than me tell me um, that it was a disloyal thing to do. 
Uh, I didn't follow their advice either. And pleasingly, I was far from alone. Uh, there are a number of good Liberals who joined me in that fight, particularly in the Senate, uh, including at the time Corey Bernardi, now no longer a Liberal, uh, who sponsored a, a private member's bill to address 18C, uh, which attracted a number of co-sponsors. And through a process of months of campaigning and putting pressure on, uh, we secured a parliamentary inquiry into 18C, uh, and the parliamentary inquiry eventually recommended a range of options, including reform of 18C, which the government took up. Throughout that process, uh, there was a lot of resistance, more resistance than you think there would be in the Liberal Party to that, but we pressed on, and we pressed on with confidence knowing that we were on the side of, of you know, truth and justice, um, but also the side of Liberal Party members overwhelmingly and our supporters. Now, where we fell down and we were not successful was in the Senate. And this comes to the fundamental point I want to talk about today, which is how difficult it is to achieve good reform. To get a good policy up, you have to go through a number of hurdles. And some of those hurdles are formal hurdles and some of them are informal. Uh, you have to pass through Cabinet. You have to pass through uh, backbench committees of the party, party room. You have to pass through the party room itself. You have to pass through the House of Representatives. You have to pass through a Senate committee and ultimately the Senate itself. Uh, and there's lots of informal uh, points at which you have to clear a hurdle before that that um, can prevent any of that even happening. So in order to shepherd reform of 18C through all of those hoops was a very, very difficult task and ultimately we're only partially successful. We did reform the policies and procedures of the Human Rights Commission uh, so that the QUT debacle, disgrace, can never happen again, at least in the way it did. Uh, there's a time limit now for an investigation. There's a requirement that the Human Rights Commission inform parties that they're subject to a complaint. These are good changes, but not necessarily as far as I would have liked to have gone. That shows the difficulty of getting a, a, a worthy reform up. The flip side is that if there are bad things happening in politics, sometimes it is easy to defeat them. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, about 18 months ago, when I was still relatively new in the Senate, a proposal to sign an extradition treaty between the Australian government and the Chinese government was put to the parliament. Uh, I was deeply uncomfortable with this, uh, in, even just in principle. Uh, the Chinese government boasts that it has a 99.9% .9 conviction rate in its criminal justice system. Uh, and I was not willing to sign up to a policy that would see Australian citizens or other people who happen to be in Australia extradited to such a... Uh, appalling travesty of a criminal justice system. But it was the policy of the government that I was a member of. Uh, and uh, when uh, this proposition was going to be put to the parliament in the form of a disallowance motion uh, that was going to be supported by the Labor Party and others, there was a prospect uh, that it could be defeated. But in order for it to be defeated, it probably would have required some Liberals uh, or enough people on the crossbench to defy their party's position and cross the floor uh, and vote in favour of this disallowance motion. So I did what I thought was the right thing. Uh, I sought advice from people that I trusted. Uh, I attended the relevant uh, meeting of the party to discuss this issue and I put my, record, my, con my con concerns on the record uh, and uh, all hell broke loose after that. A huge amount of pressure was brought to bear on me, much more than in the 18C experience, and I was told that I was jeopardising something very important. Something to remember about this experience was that it was a long time before the Sam Dastyari affair, uh, a long time before the events of this week uh, on China, uh, and it was not f at the forefront of most people's minds in Canberra and in the political space, the, the problems of Chinese foreign interference and, and pressure on Australia. So it wasn't an easy thing to defy uh, that pressure. But ultimately, because of the action taken by me uh, and others, including Andrew Hastie and Tim Wilson and my colleague from Tasmania, Jonathan Dunningham, uh, the government decided to withdraw uh, that regulation rather than risk it being defeated in the Senate. So in the end, all it required was a small group of us who were determined to resist the pressure that was put upon us to say we weren't going to go along with this. And I think post the Dastyari affair and recent events of foreign interference, we're feeling fairly vindicated by the stance that we took. Nick was way too modest in talking about his experience and involvement in the emissions trading scheme debate because it's another very good example of that where uh, bad ideas can be stopped if people are determined to do so and are willing to put their own careers on the line. Uh, it was an extraordinarily remarkable thing for a, for a member of the Shadow Cabinet, for the leader of the uh, Liberal Party in the Senate, to resign uh, from the front bench. And I had a front, uh, view, row, uh, front view, row view of that experience because I happened to be working uh, for Mitch Fifield, Senator Mitch Fifield at the time, who was another person who resigned. And uh, one of my proudest days in politics was a very menial task. And that was hand delivering Mitch Fifield's resignation from the front bench 
uh, both to then Senator Minchin's office and the leader uh, Malcolm Turnbull's office. Uh, they did a very brave thing, a very difficult thing, but it's lucky that they did because had they not, not only would the ETS have passed um, and Kevin Rudd scored a huge political victory, which might have led him to staying on as Prime Minister much longer, but the task of us eventually repealing the ETS would have been uh, extremely difficult, if not impossible. One of the um, things that people don't remember about that ETS debate today is that um, very quickly the ETS was going to transition to a property rights phase uh, where the ETS permits would have, uh, have the status of property. And that means that a future Commonwealth Government seeking to abolish an ETS to repeal it as we eventually did in the form of the carbon tax in 2013 would have had to pay compensation on just terms to all the people who had bought permits, uh, which could have been a tens of billions of dollar compensation bill which could have prevented us from doing it. So Australian history uh, and the history of the Liberal Party would have been very different if it wasn't for people like Nick Minchin. Thank you. Thanks, James. And uh, just for the record, I'm a Victorian. Uh, so uh, I want to move on now to the future. And uh, not that James is in the future. I actually see you as a big part of the future, James. Uh, Harry Stutchbury is the president of the New South Wales Young Liberals. And uh, he first came to my attention, and I imagine the attention of a lot of other people, when he wrote an article calling for the family home to be included in the means test for the pension which basically sent Talkback Radio and uh, I know a lot of you are here, but old and titled Baby Boomers into a head spin. And uh, uh, he, he, he's also uh, written very provocably on uh, a freer migration system, which also attracted uh, some attention from higher ranks in the Liberal Party. So he's not afraid uh, to say what he thinks, which is a very good thing. Please welcome Harry up to the lectern. Thank you very much, and as much as I love to uh, beat up Victorians, I won't be doing that today. Um, I'm actually being, got a fairly large section on praising the Victorian division in this. So I want to talk about um, the history a little bit of uh, the New South Wales Liberal Party and the Liberal Party generally, as well as going forward organisationally and what I think our division will look like in the future. So um, I've got a sort of a theory that historically um, centre-right parties across the Western world in particular uh, after World War II basically created a coalition of people designed to stop and um, sort of catered to stop Fabian social, socialism entrenching into our societies in one way or another. That was most successful, I think, in Australia as well as in the United States, um, as well as the UK to some degree and much less successful in Europe. Uh, but in Australia, the Liberal Party and the, sort of Robert Menzies in particular did a lot to do with preventing us descending into a sort of social democratic state as we see in, the, in sort of mostly in Europe. Now, uh, my view is that now that the sort of the scourge of sort of mainstream socialism and communism has been rooted out mostly from everywhere but the sort of Sydney University political economy department, um, <laughs> we now find ourselves a little bit rudderless. Um, and centre-right parties across the world, post-Reagan, post-Thatcher, post-Howard, sort of find themselves without a single um, issue to coalesce around. Now, this has taken itself in sort of a few different forms over the past, I'd say, 15 to 20 years. I think that um, the latest sort of Trump conservatism, um, sort of Bernardi conservatism is, is the newest sort of iteration of that. Uh, but in the past um, sort of 20 years, I'd say, and particularly as uh, Peter Phelps just said about the arrival of like John Hyde and Burt Kelly as the sort of dry movement within the coalition, in the, within the Liberal Party, as that being, uh, he sort of mentioned that that was... Um, before that, we were sort of exclusively a Tory paternalist party, essentially. But the arrival of that is the arrival of the free market thinking as the sort of alternate to um, socialism, like a hard, a hard capitalism, really, which hadn't really been ex properly executed before. Now, I think that that um, when I first started getting interested in politics was roughly 2008, and my first exposure to it was actually the Ron Paul 2008 presidential campaign. Uh, and I was moving the other day, I moved house and I found um, the Revolution a Manifesto um, sort of in my bookshelf, which I, I flicked through it, and it's still, I think, a fantastic book and a fantastic narrative. And it reminded me uh, ahead of this speech that at that time, um, the sort of movement du jour of the centre-right was libertarianism. At that time, that was the real thing, and everyone thought, this is what's going to take over the Republican Party. This will be the new defining thing that like, unites everyone. It can be electorally popular. Because most people, if you ask them, identify themselves as economically conservative and socially progressive or socially moderate, 
uh, and this can be marketed in a way that ticks both those boxes to some degree. It didn't really play out like that. Um, I think the global financial crisis put a bit of a hilter on it. I think the return of um, the return of neoconservatism post the sort of Iraq um, Iraq um, sort of downness around the, the sort of pessimistic, pessimistic view about how the Iraq War ended. Once that moved on, and we decided that all that everyone again is all uh, neocons, that brought us all back to a sort of stronger conservatism, which has now morphed into a sort of Trump conservatism in some sort of way. Um, now, I think that this um, is a very sort of interesting series of steps. But what I think is most interesting is now, as I want to pivot to the future of the, of the Liberal Party, particularly in New South Wales, is that the people who were sort of 16, 17, 18, around that, um, that sort of Ron Paul, um, Rand Paul, um, Julian uh, Amash, that was his name, but it's Julian Amash, isn't it? Justin, Justin Amash, yeah, yeah. Uh, around that era, when that really, really heated up and Cato and Heritage Foundation were really firing, um, are now very much coming of age within divisions across the state. And I think about um, the series of Victorian uh, young liberal presidents, yourself, Simon, when Evan was ALSF president, and uh, Matthew Lesh and others, uh, so thoroughly libertarian to so, such a degree, uh, such a greater degree than any other sort of divisional president has ever been. And it was like a real achievement. And to me, it shows that um, the future of the Liberal Party is an extremely malleable thing because I, I often talk about the New South Wales Young Liberal Movement as essentially running the state of New South Wales in some degree. Because if you look at New South Wales' cabinet, um, the Premier of New South Wales is a former Young Liberal President. The Treasurer, Dominic Perrottet, who Peter Phelps mentioned, is a former Young Liberal President. Uh, the Energy and Resources Minister is a former Young Liberal President. The Transport Minister is a former Young Liberal President. Half of cabinet are former Young Liberal Presidents or you know, executive members. This, this sort of degree to which the Liberal Party is a malleable object is thoroughly, thoroughly and completely underrated, completely underappreciated. It's basically like the Young Liberal Movement has 2,000 members, right? It's 2,000 members. It takes five active, committed, uh, active, committed activists working full time to completely change the organization. That's essentially it. If you talk to people, they'll say that these things can change incredibly quickly. And if you do it successfully for a long period of time, you can change entirely what the state looks like. This is my pitch to people when they say, why should I be involved in politics? Why should I be involved in major parties? When they just kowtow to um, some special interest groups and this sort of thing. Is well, if you, if you instill and support people within the Liberal Party that believe in things that have a solid ideological anchor, that are committed to classical, the classical liberal tradition, that are leaning libertarian, and if that's what you want, and if you work hard and commit to it, then that outcome is entirely achievable. So what I was saying before about the sort of people coming of age now that um, were, grew up and had their ideological foundation set in the sort of libertarian era that I think, it might not be an era, I might just be sort of a bit nostalgic about it, but, um, <laughs> but uh, are really coming of age now, particularly in the New South Wales division, but across the country. Um, and I think it's something that um, I'm quite proud of and quite passionate about, and I think is an extremely good sign for the future of the New South Wales division, uh, if that is what you're interested in. So thank you very much.